Mr. Strauss's chemistry corner was filmed before a live studio audience. Any images or uh, reproductions may not be used without the express written consent of Mr. Strauss. In our last episode of Chemistry Corner, Mr. Strauss found himself trapped in a cave by a ferocious polar bear. He was only able to escape by throwing water on the bear and thus dissolving him. Let us now begin a new episode of the Chemistry Corner. Well, today, Rodney, we are going to be looking at um, types of bonding in solids. And as you know, uh, in my show, there's absolutely no um, product placement. Just let me finish this off. So you can enjoy your chemistry viewing without any worry of subliminal messages. But if you do find that you have moles, um, just call Avogadro Extermination at 602 10, 23. All right. Well, Rodney, let's begin. The first type of solid we're going to examine are network covalents. Uh, examples of network covalents are diamond, and graphite. The thing about network covalent solids is that um, they're composed completely of covalent bonds, but these bonds continue on and on and on in a repeating pattern. So what you have is one massively large molecule. So a network covalent contains all covalent bonds that repeat in a regular pattern. One of the easiest examples to show in a two-dimensional board is graphite. Graphite is composed completely of carbon atoms. And at every vertice, there is a carbon atom. And in between the atoms is your covalent bond. But the structure is not just one hexagon. The structure continues to repeat itself over and over, continuing on and on throughout the molecule. And so you have a, a repeating hexagonal, hexagonal pattern that just continues on and on and on and on to the end of the molecule. So technically, it's incorrect to say that you have a molecule of graphite because you can't isolate just one portion of the graphite molecule. It continues on and on. It would be more proper to say that you have a macromolecule of graphite. And so a network covalent um, contains all covalent bonds that repeat in a regular pattern. Now for graphite, it's a two-dimensional repeating pattern. And the layers of graphite just pile up one right after the other. And layers of graphite are able to um, roll past each other. They're like pancakes stacked up. And so when you are writing, there's graphite in your pencil lead. It's not lead at all, but graphite you are able to sluice off one layer of graphite at a time and leave it on your paper. And that's how a graphite pencil works. But a diamond has a very different structure. A diamond is also composed completely of carbon, but instead of being a two-dimensional structure like graphite, the hexagonal pattern is 
three-dimensional, still hexagons, but they're linked in three dimensions. And because of that, when you try to deform a diamond, you stress not just in one dimension, but you stress in three dimensions, making it very, very difficult to break. And therefore, diamond is one of the hardest substances known to uh, mankind. Because of this repeating network pattern, narrow covalents have very high melting and boiling points. They also, because the bonds are so strong, the electrons are stuck between the carbons. The electrons do not migrate throughout the molecule. Because of this, they do not conduct electricity. And they do not dissolve in water. So they are the strongest uh, bonds that were covalent. Any questions, Rodney? Good. We then move on to ionic solids. Ionic solids are composed of ionic bonds, also repeating in a regular pattern. We are not going to spend a very in-depth um, explanation of ionic solids. Um, Instead, uh, we're going to go over just a very simple explanation, and that explanation is going to focus entirely around sodium chloride. The formula for sodium chloride is NaCl. And if I were to draw sodium chloride, it would look something like this. You'd have chlorine molecule with a minus one charge surrounded by six smaller sodiums. Each of these sodiums would have a plus one charge. What hold the bond between the sodiums and the chlorines together is an ionic bond. Each of these lines that I have drawn is an ionic bond. So what holds the sodium and the chlorine together is the stealing of electrons and the attraction of positive charges to negative charges. So if there are six sodiums surrounding the chlorine, why is my formula not Na6Cl1. Well, if we continue this picture out, we can see that around every sodium are six chlorines, each with a minus one charge. So around every chlorine is six sodiums, and around every sodium is six chlorines. So you have Na6Cl6, 
Well, if you reduce that, you end up with sodium chloride, Na1Cl1. Technically, it is incorrect to say a molecule of sodium chloride for this reason. You cannot tell which atom is bonded to which atom. In essence, this chlorine is bonded to all six chlorine, uh, sodiums. And this sodium is bonded to all six chlorines. And this chlorine is bonded to another six sodiums. And the pattern continues on and on and on and on. So you cannot isolate just one sodium bonded to one chlorine. That does not exist. An isolated pair. It's a large molecule that continues to repeat over and over and over. You've got a sodium, chlorine, sodium, chlorine, and that pattern just continues to repeat. So instead of saying a molecule of sodium chloride, you should say formula unit. Now we haven't used this terminology before, but formula unit refers to the ratio of ions in an ionic solid. So in sodium chloride, the ratio is 1 to 1. Okay? Anything that has ionic bonding is an ionic solid. So technically, you should not be saying a molecule of sodium chloride. You should say, I have a formula unit of Na1Cl1. Now, like I said, we're just going to do a quick overview of ionics, and um, we're going to focus uh, entirely on sodium chloride. The pattern here is 6 to 1. This is specific for sodium chloride. Other ionic solids, potassium chloride, um, you're going to have a different repeating pattern. It might be three atoms surrounding one, uh, three ions to one. It might be for every two ions, there are three. So um, we're not going to get into a uh, detailed analysis of that, but if you look in your book, they'll talk about all different types of crystals, face-centered cubic, or face-centered crystals, body-centered crystals. Um, so uh, for more information, I would refer you there. Properties. Ionic solids also have high melting and boiling points. Because ionic bonds are strong bonds. But not as strong as the network covalent. Diamonds and graphite have the highest melting points. Ionic crystals like potassium chloride and sodium chloride, they have high melting points as well, but not as high because ionic bonds are not as strong as um, covalent. Sharing is caring, and sharing is a stronger bond than stealing. Other properties, um, ionics dissolve in water. And when they do so, they become conductive, very conductive. So if you were to put a light bulb in perfectly distilled water, um, it would not light up. But if you put a light bulb into salt water, dissolved sodium chloride in water, the ions pluses and the minuses carry the electrons and allow the uh, current to flow and therefore light up the light bulb. I'll demo this for you um, when I return. Rodney, any questions about ionic solids? No. Sounds good. All right, we are moving right along. In that case, let us 
venture into our third type of solid, which is metallic. As with ionic solids, we're going to give a very brief overview, and um, to really understand uh, metallic solids requires much more in-depth uh, analysis of it. Um, for our purposes, we're going to just kind of look at a, a general overview. Uh, metals, as you know, are really the thing to the left of the staircase on the periodic table, and therefore the bonding more or less is essentially the same in, in all metals. Uh, with metals, uh, you have what's called a uh, sea of electrons that are attracted to all the nuclei of the metal. So it's not covalent, it's not ionic, it's its own type of bonding, metallic bonding. And the example I'm going to use here is uh, copper to explain this. So if you were to look at a metal under a powerful electron microscope, you would see that the nuclei are fixed in place according to some pattern. Now this pattern will vary from metal to metal. Um, but the nuclei are fixed in place. And the electrons are flying around going from atom to atom. The electrons are flying in no discernible pattern. They just move from nuclei to nuclei. Um, one of the ways I like to envision this are bees in a flower field. Okay? A bee is not attached to one flower. A bee can go from flower to flower to flower. Flowers are the nuclei. They're fixed in place. And at any one moment, there's always some electrons at every nuclei, and there's always some bees at some flower. But the bees are moving in, in no discernible pattern uh, from place to place. What keeps a metal together, what bonds it together, is the attraction of all the electrons to all of the protons. Okay, it's not a one-to-one -one attraction. That electron is, creates a fog or a cloud of negativity. And that negativity kind of bathes over those positive uh, ions that are stuck in place. Uh, that's the analogy, the sea of electrons, what I have heard is, to imagine the nuclei as pebbles on a shore and the electron cloud as the ocean that just washes over it. So as you know, electrons are both a particle and a wave. So you have this cloud of electrons that's attracted to all of the positive nuclei. So once again, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. And therefore, just like network covalence and ionics, technically you should not say molecule of copper. Okay? You can't have a molecule of copper. You can only have an atom of copper. So um, metallic bonding. Um, is weaker than the other two. So we would say that they have moderately high melting and boiling points. Okay. Uh, they do not dissolve in water. As you know, if you throw a penny in water, it does not dissolve. But it does conduct the best. Why does it conduct electricity so well? The reason why it conducts electricity so well is because the electrons are not stuck in place. The electrons are free to move. Now, having the electrons just move in any old direction isn't very helpful. Okay? So to get a current 
you need to have all the electrons flow in one direction. So what you do is you attach it to a, a voltage differential, meaning on one side positive, on one side negative. So if I create a voltage differential such that on this side I have negative charges, and on this side I have positive charges, a voltage differential can be created by your power station, uh, it can be created by a battery. And so what happens is all the electrons, instead of going in a random direction, they'll all flow towards the positive charge. thereby creating a current. And then you can use that current to power your machines, whether it be um, a battery powering your iPod or a cell phone, or uh, powering uh, an overhead, or uh, powering your TV at home. But to get these electrons to flow in one direction is what allows the current to flow and therefore machines to work. Isn't that amazing? I would say it's absolutely shocking. So. Um, that, again, is a quick overview of metals. Um, basically, this is the principle of following any type of, of metal. Again, the pattern will differ, um, but that is uh, more or less it. So to review, the strongest bonds were by the network covalent, followed by ionic, and then metallic. As I said, technically speaking, these three things do not form molecules. However, you will hear people use this inappropriately many times and say, I've got a molecule of sodium chloride or a molecule of, of diamond, but technically you do not. Um, the, because they have such strong bonds, they are solids at room temperature. these three, the next strongest bond was the dipole-dipole. And we discussed that at length uh, in our previous session. Because this is a moderately strong bond, it is a liquid at room temp. Usually. Um, because you form partial and negative charges, partial negative and partial positive charges, you will conduct electricity just a little bit. Because the bond is not very strong, again, the melting and boiling point is not very high. So this leaves us with one more um, type of bond to discuss. And that is van der Waal forces. Van der Waals are typically gases at room temp. 
And as I stated before, uh, it's four and five are the only places where you have true molecules. You can have a molecule of water as you do in a dipole dipole. You can have a molecule of hydrogen as you do with Van der Waals uh, forces. So the weakest type of bond is Van der Waals. And it is the attraction of electrons in one molecule towards the protons in another molecule. This attraction is very weak and temporary and very easy to break. And the best example to do is hydrogen. It's also the simplest to draw. So if you look at hydrogen, there is one proton and one electron. And it's bonded to another proton and a second electron. So there are two protons and two electrons in a molecule of hydrogen. When another molecule of hydrogen near, comes nearby, the negative electrons will feel a very weak attraction towards the protons in the other hydrogen. And as a result, you get this very weak Whoops. Not between the two protons. You get a very weak attraction between the proton in one molecule and the electrons in another. And that attraction is very, very, very weak, exists very temporarily, and then is quickly broken as the molecule moves through space. So you can have two hydrogen molecules. As they move near each other, they'll feel a slight attraction slow down, and then continue moving on. Um, so this weak attraction is the Van der Waals force. It occurs in molecules that are, um, oh, um, it is the predominant intermolecular force in nonpolar substances. Van der Waals force actually exists in all molecules, but usually it is too weak to factor into the bonding. Uh, it's only when you have typically nonpolar substances where the Van der Waals force uh, plays a significant role in the uh, intermolecular bonding. Because the force is so weak, they have very, very low melting and boiling points. They don't have a charge. It's not like hydrogen's got a plus one charge or a minus two charge. There's no partial charges. And so there's no way for the electrons to flow. The electrons are stuck there. They're stuck in that molecule. And so if the electrons are stuck, they do not conduct electricity. And for, um, I would say that Van der Waals force is the predominant force in nonpolar substances. So what I mean by that is there's an attraction of the electrons towards the protons in all substances, in network covalent, in ionics, in metallics. But that force is so weak, it doesn't matter. Um, the strength of the covalent bonds in diamond 
is so powerful that it doesn't matter that there's a very, very tiny Van der Waals force existing. Same thing with sodium chloride. Um, even though there's a Van der Waals force there, it doesn't really matter because the force is so weak. It's the attraction between the, pro uh, the positive ions and the negative ions that, that matters. And same thing with metallic. It's only when you get down to the nonpolar substances, the nonpolar substances, they don't have ionic bonds, they don't have covalent bonds, they don't have dipole-dipole bonds, so the only thing left is the Van der Waals forces. And that's why um, for nonpolar substances, Van der Waals forces becomes the predominant and the important force in the bonding. So um, a quick, quick summary, we said bonding the strongest was network covalent, followed by ionic, followed by metallic, then dipole-dipole. And then last but not least, Van der Waals. This is the order of bond strength. The order of conductivity is slightly different. For conductivity, um, metallic actually conducts the best because uh, metallic bonding, the uh, electrons are free to move. So, Metallic is the most conductive, followed by ionic. In third place comes dipole dipole because there's a partial negative and partial positive, so it conducts a little bit. Um, tied for last place are the network covalents and the Van der Waals or the nonpolars. Diamonds do not conduct because the electrons are stuck in place. Their bonds are so strong that the electrons do not move, they are stuck right where they are. So, tied for last place are network, covalent, and the same thing with our Van der Waals or nonpolar substances. Their electrons are stuck in place as well, so they do not conduct. So I hope you've enjoyed this episode as much as I have. If you'd like to check out my summer line of pocket protectors, please go to my website. Otherwise, you can see this video in its entirety at uh, uh, Strauss Verona or the Chemistry Corner. Uh, uh, until next time, uh, this is Mr. Strauss's Chemistry Corner.